On the WWE Network, everyone knows that you can't search for Chris Benoit matches. Benoit's WWE and WCW work is available for viewing, but you can't use Benoit as a keyword search to gather a list of his matches. The same rings true for Muhammad Hassan. Only one of Hassan's matches comes up, and it doesn't even say the guy's name in the clip description. Those of you who watched the WWE in 2005, though, would know that Muhammad Hassan was featured often on television shows. He had around 30 televised matches in the space of around 7 months along with a heavy amount of promo time. The fact that Hassan's work in the WWE can't be as easily searched on the WWE Network as other superstars lets us know one thing. The WWE would rather keep the Muhammad Hassan run buried in the library. And it isn't because he done the unthinkable like Chris Benoit. Muhammad Hassan was only guilty of doing what he was told to do. And what's more, Muhammad Hassan done an absolutely stellar job of portraying the character that WWE Creative wanted him to portray. Before we begin this video looking at Hassan's WWE run, I want to make it clear that I'm only focusing here on the man's television work and nothing more. This isn't going to be some based or woke nonsense where you're being forced to listen to someone's opinion on what's right and what's wrong. That's all completely up to you. You guys watch these videos to listen to old wrestling stories and that's all I'm going to provide here. I will say this though before starting, I firmly believe that Mark Capani done a great job with the Muhammad Hassan character and I don't think it should be brushed away. So let's take a look at Muhammad Hassan in the WWE. Mark Capani was born in Syracuse, New York. His family was of Italian descent, so no, Muhammad Hassan was not from the Middle East. He left university at the beginning of 2002, wishing to get into the wrestling business of which he was a fan of growing up. Mark was trained by Nick Dinsmore, better known to WWE fans as Eugene, and he was also trained by Danny Davis under the Ohio Valley Wrestling banner and under the watchful eye of Jim Cornette. Mark had his first recorded professional match against Terry Taylor on the 9th of March 2002. 2002, working as Mark Magnus, and following his debut, Mark began a run with Ohio Valley Wrestling that lasted around two and a half years. Mark was billed as an Italian superstar during his OVW run, but when the call came from the WWE looking for an Arab American character, Jim Cornette pitched Mark Magnus, and Mark Magnus became Muhammad Hassan. Hassan would compete in dark matches and house shows for the WWE towards the end of 2004, and at the same time, Hassan would also travel back to OVW to fine tune his gimmick. In OVW, there were no mentions of terrorism or anything like that during Muhammad Hassan's promos. The character was that of a man who felt that his background was leading to him getting unfairly treated in the United States. Hassan would say that the people of America made him feel like he had done something wrong and the people of America discriminated Hassan due to his kayfabe Middle Eastern descent. This same Muhammad Hassan character would be the one we would see on WWE programming. Sean Davari, a Another OVW hopeful was put with Muhammad Hassan thanks to his ability to speak the Persian language. Muhammad Hassan was introduced to WWE audiences the old-fashioned way through pre-recorded vignettes. Beginning in November of 2004, Hassan and Davari would interrupt Raw broadcasts by talking about how their world changed after September 2001, how they had been stereotyped and made to feel uncomfortable while trying to carry on in their normal day-to-day -day lives. Hassan talked about his uncle's business having to close down due to the public's discrimination, how he and Davari get way more thoroughly searched at air ports in comparison to others with a different skin colour, and really, the point that was being driven here was that Hassan and Davari were just as American as everyone else, they grew up in the same neighbourhoods and they went to the same schools, only now they have been made to feel unwanted. Their treatment in this new American society hasn't been fair at all. These promos worked as intended in 2004. Wrestling audiences booed Muhammad Hassan the day he walked into an arena thanks to the scripted promos he cut during these pre-tapes. As a matter of fact, the WWE audiences booed the very first Muhammad Hassan promo on November 1st, 2004. The WWE had just created another villain for their roster, and it is curious to think how audiences would now react to the same character being presented on TV. Not that that would ever happen, but anyway. On the December 6th, 2004 episode of Raw, during a brutal performance from Chris Jericho and Fozzie that also featured Dancing Davis in 
in the ring, the lights in the arena went out and Muhammad Hassan, along with Davari, appeared on the Titan Tron. Hassan asked the fans in attendance, how does it feel when all the fun stops and how does it feel when your world changes in an instant, trying to highlight how fast Hassan's own personal life had changed after September 11th, 2001. Hassan announced that he would show up next week on Raw and the fans of the WWE would then begin seeing the world as Hassan sees it, telling everyone that the party is now over. What can't be denied here was just how good Mark's delivery was during these vignettes and promos over the past month or so, speaking with conviction and without hesitation. He really looked like he believed in what he was saying and he was going all in with the character. There were many guys on the WWE roster who could have learned a thing or two from this rookie when it came to delivering a promo and really, the character had gained a ton of heat not just by what he said, but how he said it. Mick Foley came to the ring on the December 13th, 2004 episode of Raw after the WWE aired a video highlighting the 2003 Christmas with the Troop show. When Mick Foley announced that he was going to travel overseas for the 2004 show, Muhammad Hassan and Davari finally made an appearance inside a WWE arena. As the crowd chanted USA, Muhammad Hassan said he used to be just like Mick Foley and he used to be just like all the fans in attendance until his eyes got forcefully opened up to the truth. Hassan said that none of the people in attendance are true patriots because if they were, they would not support a war that leads to the unfair treatment of Arab Americans. Mick Foley says he can see some truth in what Hassan just said before reminding him that he's currently in a country that provides Hassan with free speech, the right to say whatever he wants no matter how stupid it may sound. Mick then got a little hot when Hassan downplayed Foley's support for the troops, challenging Muhammad to step into the ring here, but the challenge wasn't met. Hassan instead said that he wouldn't step into the ring with a man he didn't respect. And the segment was over. It was quite impactful. Muhammad Hassan didn't hold back here, but what you really have to keep in mind, at least up until the end of this video, is that Hassan not once condoned terrorism. Hassan himself portrayed the victim. He was tired of being stereotyped and the only way he felt he could get justice was by taking it out on people in the ring. This this would get twisted a little towards the end of the run, but more on that soon. Koshiro Davari and Muhammad Hassan interrupted Stacey Keebler on the December 27th episode of Raw while Stacey was giving thanks to the fans for their support in 2004. Davari screamed at Stacey to get out of the ring before Hassan began talking once again about the hypocrisy of so-called American patriots. Going over what Hassan says in his promos would make this an extremely repetitive video, but what really stands out here again was just how well the guy could deliver a promo. And this this was only his second week on live WWE television. A lot of people focus on the content of Hassan's promos and rightfully so. It was something out of the ordinary and it was put together with controversy in mind and this, I feel, sometimes overshadows Mark's deliverance of said promos. The scripts and material Muhammad Hassan was given to work with was far from typical and it says a lot about Hassan's mic work that he was able to get into the ring and speak with such passion. I do feel Mark's performance performance of the Hassan character is what made it so well received. Had someone else been given this role then it may not have been half as good. Anyway, Devari goes off on Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, leading to Hassan pushing the Raw commentary team around before staring down with the King. After the segment, Jerry Lawler says he won't be politically correct by kissing up to Hassan and Devari. The January 3rd 2005 episode of Raw featured an in-ring debate between the Raw commentary team and Hassan and Devari, based around the mistreatment of Arab Americans in society, and it ended with the King and JR taking a beating in the ring. I'm not going to talk about the debate here because it will inevitably lead to viewers going over the same debate in the comment section, but this stuff was touching a nerve on television screens with certain people and many struggled to separate reality from fiction due to how well it was being blended together. 
This all led to Jerry Lawler facing Muhammad Hassan at New Year's Revolution 2005, Hassan's WWE television debut, and as much respect as we may have for Jerry Lawler's in-ring contributions over the years, this was a bad choice for a debut match. Jim Ross came to the ring with Jerry Lawler, meaning there was no commentary for the entire bout, and I'm not sure if this was done to give the bout a unique and different feel, but it just didn't work. The audience in Puerto Rico couldn't have cared less, the match was slowed down to a snail's pace, in order to allow Lawler to work a 10 minute match. There were even mild boring chants in the audience before finally Hassan got the win with a downward spiral. It's a shame too, the Muhammad Hassan character was getting some real heat, yet his debut match was admittedly a flop. I think this would have been better if Hassan absolutely destroyed Lawler with no mercy nor remorse. But thankfully, someone paid attention and booked Hassan against Shane Helms the following night, and even though the match was only 2 minutes long, it gave us a better idea of Hassan's in-ring abilities. The Rockets were then tied to Hassan's back in the weeks that followed, delivering more deep-cutting promos that continued to get the newcomer a ton of heat. In the 2005 Royal Rumble match, Hassan entered at number 13, and before Hassan could get in the ring, all the other competitors stopped fighting each other in order to eliminate Hassan from the Royal Rumble match. Hassan took his frustrations out on Sergeant Slaughter the next night on Raw. From this point on, Muhammad Hassan got the opportunity to step inside the ring with some of the WWE's best in-ring workers, and he had no problems at all hanging in there with the likes of Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit. As Hassan was proving himself in the ring, the tone of his promos continued to draw heat. On the 28th of March 2002, one week before WrestleMania 21, Hassan got the chance to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shawn Michaels, a high-pressure match for any wrestler, let alone a relative newcomer. Not only did Hassan hang in there with HBK, but Michaels gave Hassan a lot of time here to get his stuff in, and it turned out to be a good TV match. The bout ended when Kurt Angle, Sean's WrestleMania 21 opponent, hit the ring to cause a disqualification finish. Up until this point, and going into WrestleMania 21, Muhammad Hassan had never been pinned, nor had Hassan submitted. Muhammad Hassan was annoyed that he wasn't part of the WrestleMania 21 pay-per-view on the 3rd of April 2005. Hassan said the WWE was discriminating against him and he couldn't understand how someone who had never been pinned or submitted could be left off the biggest show of the year. Because Hassan wasn't granted a WrestleMania moment, he decided to create one for himself, causing a segment interruption as Eugene was listing off his favourite WrestleMania matches and promos. With Eugene locked in the camel clutch, Real American played in the arena, out walked Hulk Hogan to save the day. Whatever you may think of this segment, at least Mark Capani can say he shared the ring with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania, not a lot of people can say that. Hogan of course destroyed Hassan and Davari before celebrating in the ring. This kicked off a feud between Hassan and Davari and Shawn Michaels and Hulk Hogan. The next night on Raw, HBK hit Hassan with a hard slap across the face when Hassan reminded Shawn that he lost at WrestleMania 21. Davari and Hassan ended up destroying Shawn in the middle of the ring, leading to HBK wanting a two-on-one match against his attackers the next week on Raw. Eric Bischoff would only grant Shawn a match if HBK could find a partner in order to turn the two-on-one match into a regular tag team bout at the Backlash pay-per-view. Muhammad Hassan once again faced Shawn Michaels on Raw, this time it was on the April 18th edition live from Madison Square Garden. And as HBK was in the middle of another beating from Hassan and Davari, the immortal Hulk Hogan came to help the heartbreak kid. The pop for Hogan was insane here by the way, the Hulkster back in the garden along with the heartbreak kid. And here you have Muhammad Hassan once again mixing it up with some of the all time greats, only this time it was in the world's most famous arena. So Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels teamed up to face Davari and Hassan at Backlash, resulting in Davari getting pinned and Hassan taking it out on his manager the very next night on Raw. Muhammad Hassan would then start moving up the ladder by getting title shots on TV. Hassan feuded with Intercontinental Champion Shelton Benjamin, and he worked with the WWE and World Champions Batista and John Cena. It's been widely reported that the plan was for Muhammad Hassan to defeat Batista at the SummerSlam show, making him the youngest World Heavyweight Champion in history in the process. But even Mark himself says that those plans could have changed in the run-up to the event. He doesn't flat out say that he was going to become the World 
world champion, but he does say that the possibility was brought to his attention. Keep in mind too that SummerSlam 2005 was being held in Washington DC, not only the nation's capital but also the place where Dave Batista called home. Muhammad Hassan winning the world title at SummerSlam would have garnered even more heat for Hassan but still, he wouldn't even make it to the pay per view. On the June 23rd episode of SmackDown, it was revealed that Hassan and Davari had been drafted to the blue brand and in no time at all, Hassan got involved in an angle with The Undertaker. A controversial segment featuring Hassan and The Taker would result in Hassan getting completely erased from the WWE. On the July 7th episode of SmackDown, The Undertaker wrestled Davari, and after Taker won the match with the Tombstone Piledriver, a bunch of masked men hit the ring after Hassan had prayed at the entranceway. The men attacked The Undertaker using clubs and piano wire to beat and choke the dead man, while Hassan got in on the action with a camel clutch. When the beating was over, the masked men raised Davari above their heads to carry him away from ringside. On the very same day, the London bombings of 2005 occurred, keep in mind that Smackdown was taped days prior. Even with this incredible coincidence, Mark himself says that the WWE may have pushed it too far this time. The footage aired unedited in North American markets while the footage was removed from the European broadcasts. Still, major media outlets including the New York Post criticised the WWE for letting the angle play out on TV. The next week on Smackdown, Hassan cut a promo, no doubt handwritten by Vince McMahon, calling out the media who attacked the WWE over the angle, saying that once again Muhammad Hassan had been singled out automatically by the people of America and people were just assuming that he was a terrorist even going as far as the single out columnists who covered the July 7th episode of Smackdown. This segment here did not air on TV, the WWE put it on their website. The whole video is viewable right now though on YouTube. Due to pressure from the UPN network, the WWE decided to remove Hassan from TV. The angle was deemed too sensitive with the network ruling that audiences were not ready to see this kind of thing on TV. Had the London attacks not happened, who knows what the outcome would have been, but Hassan was kept off TV until the Great American Bash 2005. At the pay-per-view held on July 24th, The Undertaker defeated Hassan before delivering a last ride powerbomb from the stage ramp and onto the concrete floor. It was reported that Hassan suffered legitimate serious injuries from the bump and he had to be rushed to a nearby hospital. Muhammad Hassan was never seen again on WWE TV despite the incredible promise he had shown as an in-ring WWE competitor. Both Davari and Hassan were sent back to OVW in order to repackage their characters but ultimately Mark Capani was released from his WWE contract in September of 2005. Mark said that an idea Triple H had for a return was for Mark to come back to either Raw or Smackdown, grab a microphone and say that the WWE made him go along with the character. But when you really think about it, there was maybe no getting away from the Muhammad Hassan stuff after Mark had done such a good job with the gimmick. There was, and still is, a huge amount of fan backlash over the release of Muhammad Hassan. Fans who understand wrestling knew that Muhammad Hassan had something special. His work in the ring was solid and his convincing promos made him a fast rising star in the WWE, yet it felt like Vince McMahon had given in to the media and to UPN. There's no doubt that public image is important and you'd be a fool to think otherwise, especially with a machine like the WWE, but fans of professional wrestling who understand the game know that Vince McMahon had just let go of a good talented worker here and seemingly Mark Capone was dumped on the sidewalk in order to keep up appearances. Immediately after his WWE release, Capani returned to college and he became a teacher in New York, working his way up the education system to become the principal of Fulton Junior High School. Mark didn't have any desire to get back in the ring, he wanted to do something completely different in his life and he succeeded in doing so. The itch came back though in 2018 when Hassan returned to the squared circle, working a few dates for the Dynasty promotion in Albany, New York. And you can view some of his work here on YouTube and it's cool to see fans 
fans chanting welcome back after his first entrance. Just recently, Mark began opening up about his WWE career with online interviews. I recommend checking out Chris Van Vliet's one hour long interview to get a better idea of what Mark thinks about his character and his WWE run. There's not much point in me rehashing the interview here. I guess, to wrap things up, the story of Muhammad Hassan shows that Vince McMahon and the WWE would, at one time, play with fire in order to get viewers and if it didn't work, the talent in question just became disposable. I think what stands out more though was just how talented Muhammad Hassan was and it does feel like his desire to continue wrestling was maybe taken away due to circumstances that were completely out of his control. He went out and done a great job with the gimmick he was given but even back in 2005 it seems it was too much for some people to handle. It is a shame that Vince cracked under the pressure though and it does go to show that the television networks and the money that comes along with all that is seemingly much more important than the talent themselves, at least in the eyes of the WWE.